every, every square inch of the floor is covered. I mean, blow-up mattresses were just side by side, edge to edge to edge. If there was any gap in them anywhere, it was filled in with small suitcases, backpacks, a couple of standing floor fans, from electrical outlets, maybe two or three on the walls. These, these cords snaked then through those mattresses, and the end of those cords looked like they grew tentacles because of all the phone chargers plugged in those. Those were the sleeping quarters of, of our guys who were just on our student ministry mission trip down to Puerto Rico. And girls, man, you had the exact same space, but you had a bathroom, right, and, on your side of the, of the space. Um, our team just got back this morning at 12.15, and yet, how many of y'all are here this morning from the trip? Yeah, raise your hand. Woo! I don't know how they're still standing. We, we had one of our, our youth on the tr- team came in and served at 8.30 in the kids' ministry. Mike and Kylie, you're leading worship this morning. You just got in. I mean, this is amazing to me. But it, the, the trip was, was, was great. Here's how their mornings started. Every morning, they would get up and stand in line for a cold shower. Now, 40-some people, four bathrooms. Each bathroom takes one person, right? So you do the math. Two guy bathrooms, two girl bathrooms, standing in line for a cold shower. By 7.30, everybody would be gathered in that about a 15-foot by 30-foot fellowship hall uh, in the church there in Manabo, the Methodist church we were um, working with. Scott would greet everybody in the morning, make sure everybody was, was awake and alive and doing okay. Uh, and then we would have a rousing, charging message from our own Francis Thurman. Like, it, you charge us up every day. It was like going into the championship game every day of the week, as only Francis can do. Uh, and then we would eat breakfast, and then Jamie Grace would stand up and say, here are the groups for the day. Here's who your team leaders are. Here's where you're going for the day. And, and that would include work like this. One group would stay every morning. One group stayed on campus at the church to work with all the kids from vacation Bible school. Uh, Other groups would get in the vans and just scatter. They would be maybe uh, taking out an old uh, fence that got destroyed from the hurricane, trees falling on it, chain link fence, and building a brand new one, digging the holes, taking out tree stumps, putting it in. Uh, One team went to a home and took off an old roof, put on a new roof for the laundry room and helped rebuild a laundry room for a house. Another team scraped and painted the whole outside of a house. Worst detail ever, right? Uh, Another team went and actually they bent rebar and used it to help build the framework for the cement to help build new um, roofing and new pillars for a house that was almost completely destroyed by Hurricane Maria. These are the chores, these are the tasks that these teams did and, and they're doing all of this in, in a heat index of over 100. And you'd think that when they were done after every day, that they would they'd come back, gather the church about 4 o'clock. You'd think they'd say, man, this is a great time. I'm going to get another cold shower. I'm going to just get flat on bunk for a little bit before supper. But that's not what happened. Like on Wednesday, when I, I came back Wednesday from the painting and scraping house, thank you, Scott, for that assignment, by the way. There wasn't a dry spot on me. I was just dripping, soaking wet with sweat. And, and I, all I want to do, one goal, cold shower, relax, right? Just get in the cold shower, get cleaned up. And I'm walking towards the bathroom, and Mike Kleinschmidt, worship leader, comes bounding up to me, you know, endless, boundless energy, taps me on the shoulder, says, hey, Rich, you want to go do a couple house visits before supper? I'm like, No. I don't. That's what my brain was saying. My brain, like, are you? Are you outside of your mind? I've been, I've been scraping. I, I was doing rebar in the morning and scraping and painting all after. I want to get a cold shower and relax and get supper. And, and, but Mike, he was just so appealing. Like he's like, we're gonna go do these house visits. Like one lady, she had fallen and gotten hurt, and we knew her from our last couple of times here. Let's go bless her. And there's a, another lady who's been sick, and she just needs um, some encouragement. Let's go bless her. So I said, yeah, okay. He's like, all you have to do is change your shirt. I'm covered in paint and sweat, so I take my shirt off, wring it out, hang it up, put another shirt on, and within two minutes, it's soaked through. I jump on the bus, and there's Kim Roo driving the bus. Uh, pastor Joanna, she's the pastor of the church there. She's navigating for us. Uh, Mike and Kylie spring onto the van with their guitars, and the rest of the van is filled with our youth who've worked all day but who couldn't wait to not stop but keep going and go into people's homes and just bless them. 
So we go into people's, people's homes and with an interpreter, we introduce ourselves and talk for a few moments. Mike and Kylie would lead us in a worship song and we'd pray. And then one of our youth would share their testimony about what God is doing in their lives right now. It was amazing. Then after that, we came back and I finally got another cold shower and we had supper. And after supper, you know, the teams just had a chance to unwind, play a little volleyball, a little basketball right there at the church. But not for long because then it was time for worship. And we gathered back in that little fellowship hall and, and you know, we would get in there. Mike and Kylie would lead worship for, for our team. And then Scott would say, hey, gang, where did you see God at work today? And Boom, 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 hands going up all over the room. Well, God was doing this over here, and God was doing this on our team, and God was doing that over there. It's just amazing to hear this. And then one of the leaders, you know, whatever leader was assigned that night would stand up, uh, our adult leaders, and, and bring the message or share their own testimony. And I'm telling you, it was powerful. Every single time one of our youth shared their testimony in a home or with each other, or one of our adult leaders shared, shared their testimony, God was moving. I witnessed the power of God moving through the words that our youth and our adults were speaking. And it was not uncommon to have our youth not only impacting other people's lives, but them breaking down in tears saying, I want to recommit my life to Jesus. It was an amazing display of God's power through their words. And it makes me think this morning, I need to ask y'all a question. What are your words doing? What are your words producing? Are your words producing kingdom value, kingdom growth, kingdom goods? What are the words you've been saying lately? What are they doing? Or maybe are they bringing division and destruction? Are they leading people towards Jesus or away from Jesus? Listen, you don't have to be on a mission trip for your words to be powerfully used by God. I happen to believe that the most powerful use of your words is right here in your everyday lives. So what do you say we allow God this morning to show us how powerful our words are? You better buckle up, strap in, because James is going to rock our world this morning. So if you're new with us, uh, we're, we're digging into this letter written by a guy named James. James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. I mean, when the church was brand new, starting out, uh, growing like crazy, James was the leader and a lot of his, his church members, a lot of his, you know, the, the, the new believers in Jesus had scattered into all the nations around them because of persecution in Jerusalem. And so James wrote this letter. It is one of, if not the earliest letter we have in the New Testament. He writes this letter to encourage and equip and empower these believers to live as real Christians in the real world. And here's what he wrote. Today we're going to get into James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. If you've got your Bible, open it up. If you've got your phone, just tap your Bible app. James 3, beginning in verse 1. James writes, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So James is starting out with a warning saying, hey, Many of you, not many of you are going to be, you know, teachers or preachers. He's talking about preachers and teachers of God's word. Because if you're a preacher or a teacher of God's word, you're going to be, you're going to be judged by God more severely, more strictly. Christian, does this scare you a little bit? It should, right? It, it scares me. I'm one of these guys, right? And, and I'm, I'm going to ask God, well, why? Like, that's not fair, right? Why, why are you picking on us? Why, why, why is it, why is it that, that what I do is different than anyone else does? And, and, and the answer is pretty simple because God knows the power of words. And when we're taking God's word and explaining it with our words, we've got to do it correctly. If we don't do it rightly, we have the power of words to lead people away from God. And God will hold us accountable to that. Now, here's the reality. People have been doing this for, for centuries. I mean, how many times do you, do you read in, in Paul's letters where he's rebuking false teachers who've risen up in the church, bringing false teachings into the church, or even, even today, how often do we hear people bringing false teaching into the church that is not biblical truth, but the churches are gobbling it up like it is, and God says, you don't do that. That's not right. Now, most of y'all are not going to become preachers or teachers. 
But James is about to go way beyond preachers and teachers. He's about to pull all of us into the conversation about how important your words are. As a follower of Jesus, you have to control what you say. Words have the power to hurt, to heal, to break, or to build. What you say matters. Now, there are times it seems like words matter more than at other times. For instance, when I was flying down to Puerto Rico to meet up with our youth team, I was flying from La Trobe down to Puerto Rico. First leg of my trip was La Trobe down to Orlando. And so I'm flying Spirit Air. How many of you have ever flown Spirit Air? God bless you, right? So I'm flying Spirit Air, and in, in, you know, I'm trying to save money, so I didn't spend six bucks to choose my seat. I let them choose my seat for me randomly, which means I'm the last guy to board, and I'm sitting in a beautiful middle seat, right? So I'm walking on the plane when the last like three or four guys on, and I finally get to my seat, and, and I felt so bad. The lady on the aisle is like 90 with a walker, and I had to make her stand up and move out of my way so I could squeeze in. A little bit awkward, right? She was very kind. She let me in. I sit down, and no sooner do I sit down than the flight attendant begins going through her repertoire of how to prepare for the flight. And you know the, you know the routine, right? Uh, here's your seatbelt. It connects like this. Straight, tighten it by pulling this strap. Make sure it's tight around your hips. There are emergency exits here, 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 and some are behind you. Make sure you know the closest ones to your seat. If the cabin pressure air begins to drop, please know a oxygen bag will drop in front of you. Please put it on like this. Do your own before you help anybody else. And finally, at the very end, they talk about the life preserver. She says, in the event of an emergency water landing, beneath your seat, you will find a light, a flotation device. And she pulls one out. It's in a bag. And she shows us how to rip it open because it's you know, rocket science, how to rip a bag open. But you rip it open, and, and then there is this big yellow life preserver you put over your head. She says, don't forget, there's a light here. Hit this. It'll blink to tell people where you are. And you pull this cord. It will inflate automatically. And if not, blow in this tube. And the whole time she's saying that, I'm thinking, hey, lady, if we have an emergency landing on water, we have way bigger problems than you think because we're going from Pittsburgh to Orlando. There's no water between here and there. If we're landing by emergency landing on water somewhere, we are way off course, right? So I'll be very honest with you. I'm smiling, I'm nodding, and I'm not listening to her, right? Because this does not affect me. Their words are not important. But the second leg of my journey was from Orlando to the island of Puerto Rico, Again, I didn't spend six bucks, so I got a nice, comfy middle seat between two people. And I sat down, and as soon as I sat down, the flight attendant starts going through her repertoire of stuff. Exact same words, exact same order, but this time when she gets to the life preserver, rapt attention. I'm, I'm listening to everything. I'm in my brain. I'm going through it in my brain. I'm going to put that over here. I'm going to hit that. I'm going to pull this. I'm going to blow in there. You know why? Because this time I'm flying over an ocean where I might need it. There are times when words seem more important than at other times. But here's a problem with that. You and I are not good judges of when our words are important or not. That's why we have a phrase, putting a foot in, in your mouth, right? We're not good judges of that. So what God has done graciously, he's about to light this up for us. He's going to put a big blanket statement out there and just remind us that your words are important all of the time, not just sometimes. So here's what James writes next. Verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Like we all make mistakes. We all sin. None of us is perfect. James says, unless... like. No one's perfect, but if you've, if you've always been able to keep your mouth under control, if you've never said anything out of line or out of order, if you've never uh, exploded at your wife or unloaded on your kids, if you've never said anything, you know, mean or, or, or critically uh, about a coworker behind his or her back, if you've never passed gossip at somebody at school, if you've, if you've never said anything mean about or to anyone ever then way to go. Wow, you're the one person on the face of the planet that is perfect. James says that's how powerful our tongue is. That, that if, you, if you can control what you say, then you control everything else about you. That's how powerful your tongue is. In fact, here's your first fill-in this morning. Your tongue is the most powerful 
and dangerous part of your body. How powerful? Let's find out. Listen to what he says next. Verse 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. How many of you have ever ridden a horse? I, I, I love that. I grew up with horses. I love riding. Um, before we had our horses, though, we used to ride our neighbor's horses and ponies. Like, we were little, so we rode his ponies. And he had a big barn and a big pasture. And he gave us permission to grab lead ropes out of the barn, go out, wrangle up the ponies, bring them in, and ride them. Just take turns. And so we would do that. And we never put a saddle on. We always just rode bareback. We rode the hair off those things. But we always made sure we put a bridle and a bit on every pony we rode. You know why? Because as much as we loved riding the ponies... They hated us riding them. And they would take every opportunity to brush us off against a tree or against a fence. Any chance that we came back with bruised knees, 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 I've heard it it both ways. Um, (laughs) Thank you, psych fans. Um, But when you put a bit in their mouth, when you control the mouth, you control the whole animal. James says the tongue is that powerful. And he continues this in verse 4. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Verse 5, likewise, like the bit, like the rudder, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. That's how powerful your tongue is. It controls the whole course, the whole direction of your body or of your life. Now, here's how dangerous your tongue is. Let's keep reading. Same verse, verse 5. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also is a fire. Get ready for this. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Woo! James doesn't mince words. He says, hey, your tongue can be set on fire by hell. Your words can be so dangerous. Your words can lead you down a path of destruction. Your words can set fire to your life. Your words can set fire to your family. Your words can burn up a friendship. Your words can burn through your church. Your words can be so dangerous. You may be justifying feel justified in saying what you say. But listen, when your words are damaging, there's a fill-in for you. When your words are damaging, they're not from God. If your words are hurting people, they're not from God. Who was James writing this to? Remind me. Well, originally it was to the believers, right? To to, To believers, He's not writing this to people who don't follow you. He's writing to us. And he's saying this about us. We have to remember this also. We're we're the church. If your words are, are tearing apart the fabric of trust and integrity in a church, they are not words from God. James is clear about this. Your words, if you're using them that way, they are a fire that was started in hell. It's like hell started it, just caught you on fire as kindling, and Satan is using you to pass that fire on to other people's lives. You are now a tool of the enemy. Satan is using your mouth for his pleasure, for his purpose. And this is where you've got to be able to say, get behind me, Satan. I'm going to zip it and get behind me, Satan. This is where you have to begin to recognize you're not being helpful, you're being hurtful. You're actually promoting the kingdom of Satan rather than the kingdom of God. And when you do this, James says your whole body is now corrupt. Like, no matter whatever good you do elsewhere with other parts of your body, your whole body is now corrupt. You've begun to believe the enemy's lies, you're opposing God's truth, and your whole life is set on fire by this. And friends, please don't misunderstand this. This is not just about the spoken word. Listen, you you have the opportunity today more than ever for your voice to be heard further, faster, with greater impact in more people's lives than ever before in the history of the world because of social media. 
Now, social media can, it, it's a great thing. Like down in Puerto Rico, I'm getting bleeps on my phone, code red weather warning alert for a flood at my house. Now, I'm not there, but my wife and kids are, right? And so I was glad for social media technology like that. But listen, I believe if, if, if James knew about social media back then, he would have included it right here in his letter. Like everything that, that, you, that you put out there can be used in, in, in powerfully negative ways. You can ruin someone's life. You can ruin someone's marriage. You can ruin someone's ministry. You can ruin someone's perspective on the church just by what you pass on or what you write. So every email, every text, every post, every time you like or love something on Instagram, you're making your voice heard by so many people. So what are you writing? What are you posting? What are you passing along? There will always be people who will pick up whatever you have written, pour more fuel on it, make it a bigger fire, and send it out to more people. Listen, friends, you are responsible for the words that you say and the words that you write. Will they please God or will they please Satan? Let's keep reading. James writes this in verse 7. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. Think about that for a minute. All kinds of birds, animals, reptiles, sea creatures. How many of y'all have ever been to SeaWorld? You ever been to SeaWorld? Man, that was a sad day when they closed SeaWorld in Ohio. That was for me. That was one of my favorite days of the summer. Every summer, we would load up our car in Butler, my family, and drive to Aurora, Ohio. Remember Geauga Lake, right? On one side of the lake was the amusement park, and the other side was, was SeaWorld. And we would walk into SeaWorld, and I loved it. And I was amazed that they could train like sea otters and, and sea lions and penguins and dolphins to do all these amazing tricks. But I was most amazed by the fact that they could train a killer whale not to eat its trainer. Right, remember that? Someone would jump in, in, in the, into the, the water with Shamu and think, oh my gosh, I can't watch. And then Shamu would come up out of the water with a trainer standing on his nose and throw him up in the air. I think he's going to eat him on the way down. Or, or they say, hey, we need, a, we need, we need a, a volunteer. Hey, young man, you come over here. They pull a kid up. They put him right beside um, Shamu's you know, glass wall. Shamu wants to give you a kiss. Hey, buddy, he's, like, he's going to eat your face off. He's not going to give you a kiss. He's a killer whale. It's amazing to me what we are able to do. Do you ever think about the fact, James says they were training animals back then, even sea animals? I'm thinking, what, what were you training? What kind of sea animals and why? Welcome to Jerusalem Undersea Adventure. We hope you enjoy your... Please keep your hands and feet in the car at all times. Shamu bites. But, I don't know, but apparently they were. They were training sea animals back then. But then listen to this, verse 8. He says, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Listen, if there's anywhere you don't want poison, it's in your mouth, right? So if you have poison in your mouth, what's the first thing you want to do with it? Yeah, someone last night said, swallow it. I said, What? It means you're going to die, right? Yeah, you spit it out. But here's the thing. Our tongue, our words, if, if they are a poison, no matter if you swallow or spit it out, it's deadly both ways. It's deadly to you going in. It's deadly to others going out. It is deadly poison in both directions. When I was, when I was in college, I would come home, and every summer I would work, serve at the church, uh, by volunteering with our youth group. And back in, in that day, Jeff Greenway was uh, over the youth ministry of the church. And one day, Jeff called me up and said, hey, Rich, tomorrow morning, come with me. We're going to go do a basketball mission ministry. I don't know what that means, man, but I'm all in. And so I met him at the church, and he had picked a, a, an outside neighborhood court where he knew a bunch of teenagers hung out every Saturday morning playing basketball. And he wanted to go just kind of, you know, witness to them, but play basketball with them as a way of doing that. And so we drove up to that court, and a bunch of teenagers are up there, and he didn't introduce himself. And understand, Jeff was just an amazing basketball player. Me, not so much. Within five or ten minutes, everybody on the court respected Jeff because he was such a great ball player. I'll never forget this. This one kid goes in for a shot, misses the shot, and he's so mad that this colorful flurry of words come out 
that would have made a sailor blush, right? And Jeff just grabs a rebound, stops, looks at the kid and says, man, do you eat with the same mouth that you talk with? And the kid's like, yeah, why? Jeff's like, it's nasty, dirty. And then Jeff said, by the way, I'm the pastor down at this church. Y'all need to come hang out with us sometime. Great way to witness. But here, here's the reality. We all say things we wish wouldn't come out of our mouths. It's like poison coming out of our mouths. No human being can tame the tongue. Did you hear that? No human being can tame the tongue, but Jesus can. That's your fill in. Jesus has the power to tame your tongue. And here's why. Jesus doesn't start with your tongue. Jesus starts with your heart. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But here's why this is so important. Here are the last three verses of this passage. Verse 9. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. How many of you are guilty of this in the past week? Yeah, some of you are not raising your hands, are probably lying. Okay, that's okay. Um, but we, we all do this, right? Verse 10, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. And this, this is where James gets to the heart of it. And by heart, I mean heart. What's coming out of you is because of what's inside of you. James is getting down to your roots. He's drilling down to your character now. And he says that the condition of your heart determines what comes out of your mouth. Like who you are at your core determines what you say. And here's what this means for you. It means you need to make a decision of who's going to have control of your heart. You can't control your tongue. But you can give control of your heart to someone, whether it's you or Satan or Jesus. The condition of your heart will determine what you say. Will your heart be one that is designed and grown by God or one that is set on fire by hell? Now, here's what Jesus taught about this. One day, and some of you may recognize this event in Scripture, one day some Jewish leaders came to Jesus. And they, they, were, they were called Pharisees and teachers of the law. They were the people who were all about keeping the law of the Jews. They were all about the ritual, the regulation, the traditions. And so they come to Jesus. I mean, they're like, they're like stray dogs on a ham bone. They were so bristled up and ready to feast on Jesus. And they say, Jesus, why do your disciples keep breaking our tradition because they don't wash their hands before they eat? I don't know how many of y'all have kids. You have that same conversation at your house, right? But this was not about getting dirt off their hands. This was their tradition. The, the Jews had a ritual, and it varied a little bit from place to place, but pretty much it went like this. They would have a cup, sometimes with a handle on each side, and before they ate, they had to wash their hands in a very special way, pouring twice over the right hand, then taking the other handle and pouring twice over the left hand, and that was ritual cleansing. Now they were free to eat. And apparently, these, these Jewish leaders have been spying on Jesus' followers because they say, hey, we've been watching, and they're not doing it before they eat. Why not? I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe because some of them weren't Jewish. They didn't know the Jewish law and ritual. Or maybe the ones who are Jewish just finally figured it out that it's not about a ritual. It's about relationship with Jesus that matters, right? Whatever the reason was, they're not washing correctly, and the Jewish leaders are all upset. They're breaking tradition. So Jesus fired back at them. He said, but why do you, Jewish leaders, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? And he said to them these words, you hypocrites. The prophet Isaiah was right about you when he prophesied, these people honor me with their lips, but their what? Hearts are far from me. Like, Jesus, like I, I hear what you're saying, Jewish leaders. I hear your words. But the reality is I also know your hearts, and they're not right. Get your heart right. Then what you say will be honest and pure 
and true. Now, there was a crowd gathered around also. So Jesus has his followers. He has the Jewish leaders. He has this crowd. And he turns to the crowd and he says to them, hey, I want you to know that what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But what comes out is what defiles a person. You can go through all the rituals. You can look good on the outside, even sound good at times. But your words will betray you. Later, Jesus explained this further to his disciples. Now he's got a smaller group, just his, his followers. And here's what he said to them. He said, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. In other words, your heart is the source of your mouth. Your mouth expresses your heart. If your heart is not surrendered to God, then your words will prove it. But here's the good news. Jesus has been in the heart-changing business forever, and he always will be. Jesus is able to do this. If you let Jesus work on your heart, you can have a mouth that praises and pleases God. You can have a mouth that builds the kingdom, not tears it down. You can have a mouth that leads people to Jesus. This is what I saw over and over again in Puerto Rico. This is what I saw when they shared their testimonies, when they talked to each other, when they shared out in people's homes, when, when Mike Toussaint shares his testimony and, and a young girl breaks down crying because she knows she's got to give her life to Jesus. Our words carry that much power. So friends, check your words. What's their source? Make sure you're speaking from a heart that is surrendered to God for his glory, not Satan's. Because this, this is how real Christians live. Pray with me. Jesus, thank you for being a God that cares about the things we say. Because you care about the people we reach with our words. You don't want anyone misled, so you've said to pastors and teachers, get it right or I will judge you harshly. But you also say to all of us that what we say matters, what we write matters, what we post matters. Lord, whether it's in picture form or word form, it carries our voice to a world that's waiting to hear. So Jesus, take control of our hearts because then you have control of our tongues, our voices. And we want to do this right so that what we, what we say and what we write and what we post really becomes a tool in your hand to win people to you. Jesus, let us represent you with everything that comes out of us. We commit ourselves in this to you, Jesus, and we pray this in your holy name. Amen. So, friends, here's what we're going to do. To close up this time of our worship, we're going to sing one more song together. I'm going to ask you to stand in just a moment. We're going to also take up an offering during this time. If you're a guest with us, we do this every week. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus or of what he tells us to do in his word, and that's to give generously. We want to be a generous people. Uh, if you want to give today as a guest, you're welcome to give. If you want to use the tear off as your offering, as your, if you're a guest, feel free to make that your offering today as well. But most importantly, during this time, the altar is going to be open. And if you need to come and say, you know what, God, my mouth, my mouth's been kind of used by the enemy lately, and I don't want that to continue. I'm going to be a person that puts forth your word with my words. If you need to have some time with Jesus about that, come on up, or for any reason, come on up to the altar. If you want someone to pray with you, let me know. I'll be so happy to step in and pray with you uh, in any way that you need it. Hey, let's stand as we sing our final hymn, knowing our final song, knowing that this altar is open for you.